ஹரே கிருஷ்ணா ரதிகாரமன் பிரபு வெல்கம் பேக் டு த மாங்ஸ் பாட்காஸ்ட் thank you very much for sparing your time and joining today for sharing the wisdom your wisdom uh, hari krishna prabhu uh, it's always a pleasure to be here with you and i believe this is our fourth co- podcast overall yes prabhu um, so yeah so it's always uh, such a pleasure speaking to you and thank you for inviting me back thank you so i thought that we could uh, today develop last time we had discussed about eco theology and that's a very important subject and you also mentioned that you have studied that quite a bit and you're focusing on that so last time we more or less laid the what are the challenges for a tradition in engaging with a contemporary issue like eco theology hmm? because intrinsically it the tradition itself doesn't talk about this directly so we have to find within the tradition the resources that can lead to appropriate engagement with this so with that maybe today we uh, we can go ahead and uh, discuss how our theology can contribute to how how we can build a, do you want to call it a gaudiya vaishnava eco theology or what word yes. would you like to use yes that's perfect gaudiya vaishnava eco theology okay bro so you know, in one sense if i just uh, tell my my orientation towards this i read the book divine nature which is probably the first book on this broad topic that was written and i found it so it contains so many important insights although of course the research keeps changing and there's a lot of updating that can be done but overall this is one of the the uh, env- ecology and deep ecology and various areas like that uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, lot of ferment happening and even raising of consciousness happening in the world uh, and uh, in the last i would say maybe a decade or two or it is in the decade maybe from the vedic tradition there is a lot of engagement happening so far more than before so what so in that sense this issue is becoming relevant and the broad hindu tradition as well as within our gaudiya tradition we seem to be also engaging much more seriously with it than in the past yeah i i very much agree and as i mentioned last time i think we have something um unique to contribute to the discussion from a gaudiya vaishnava perspective uh that can add to it that can assist in this global uh, awareness consciousness awareness of these issues and uh and um you know not only is it rising around the world but i would venture to say that it's probably in the top 3 concerns globally that people have um mm. and, uh, and 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 will continue to grow as the environment continues to deteriorate in various measures it will continue to grow and so we have uh, some uh, solutions some uh, uh some um, contributions Uh, to make from a gaudiya vaishnava perspective that i think are very important to it 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 is our responsibility uh to bring those to the table and and do our bit in in both teaching it and also practicing it yeah you know when you use word like top 3 would you like to just quickly enunciate those what you consider to be top 3 um i i didn't have any specific things in particular but i think uh, i would say uh ecology is definitely one uh human rights in various uh, aspects is another global uh concern definitely. and 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 then uh the the aspect of political stability uh in various parts of the world is always uh, also an ongoing concern mm. so there's a there's a handful of important things that okay. that uh, continue to emerge but yeah, um ecology that, is definitely there yeah i agree that uh different people may rate it differently but definitely this would be uh, an important problem and uh, more important than how important the problem is is that we could say we have something important which can we can contribute from our tradition and show uh, the relevance of our traditions wisdom in today's world mm-hmm. yes bro so how would you like to begin the dis- this discussion are there some specific uh, elements that you feel are important one of the things which i noticed is that uh, see 
non-violence ahimsa is uh, it's uh, it's very much associated with animal rights today but uh, it is it is often more associated with buddhism than hinduism mm-hmm. and uh, but it's a it's a important value within the broad vedic tradition although the mahabharata talks about a war there are many mentions about ahimsa also in the mahabharata so that could be that could be at a basic level where in one sense the value has been assimilated uh, has been accepted and assimilated in the west but often it has been uh, it has not its source is not duly acknowledged would that be something which you would consider yeah um so uh, ahimsa is definitely a key pillar that leads to ecological care uh in the vaishnav tradition in hinduism broadly in jainism in uh, buddhism and in each of the traditions that is born the dharmic traditions born in india uh the value of ahimsa is very central uh to those traditions and th- they go back um you know the buddhist engagement with, with ahimsa goes all the way back to the time of um you know siddhartha gautam buddha so um ahimsa is definitely an important value and it's considered to be samanya dharma right something that uh is expected of all human beings and is one of the the principles that makes us human but but i i i would say that that for uh for vaishnavas uh, we have to a- accept and embrace ahimsa but also go beyond it uh because the vaishnav principle of ahimsa i see ahimsa as a principle is is still uh uh very much about doing the right thing right how we don't want to get negative karma by harming another living entity uh we want to uh, uh practice dharma properly uh, the vaishnav uh, and and it's a negative formulation ahimsa means no injury non injury to others mm. Vaishnav principle is one of karuna or compassion daya mercy and um that is exemplified in gaudiya vaishnav literature as the ethic of para dukha dukhi right that we take another suffering as our own not just that we don't try to cause suffering that's that's the first step obviously ahimsa don't injure another but then moving a step beyond that and saying the suffering of someone else is going to be my suffering right and this is called in sanskrit anukampa kamp uh, means to tremble uh, like when someone trembles in pain or in fear and anu means with or after so mm-hmm. to tremble with someone is anukampa it's exactly the same word in english as compassion passion means to uh, suffer or to tremble and kam means with uh so to so suffer with someone right so uh, that passion means suffer huh? that's why the passion of christ it yes. talks about there okay so then today the word passion has a very different meaning in this is yes to discover your passion and things like that yes <laughs> yeah. yeah but but our ethic is one of karuna it goes much beyond you know par dukh dukhi and and the key question for us is par dukh dukhi who counts as para who is para here and and the vaishnav tradition is crystal clear that para is not merely human being uh a uh, para dukha dukhi is one who suffers to see the suffering of others right but who are the other who is the other here uh, it's not just other human beings of course other human beings but every living entity right every living every jiva is a para is an other who needs to be uh regarded in the same frame this is something propa emphasized over and over and over again in his discussions that why should we be species in just regarding the human species so we decenter the human species and we say my role is to be a compassionate to to others so the ethic of karuna i think is something that we need to add to the discussion of of ahimsa i think it brings something po- positive and very powerful ahimsa just says don't do something so you're holding yourself back karuna says you must do something right it's pushing you forward and it has ahimsa says don't feel something namely what anger injury hatred for another karuna says you must 
feel something. Mm. What do you, what must you feel? Compassion. You, you must feel that pain in yourself, right? Anukampa. Let me just pause. You know, I'll just, yeah. If you want to, we can just discuss a little bit about the speciesism that uh, in the West, especially in the Christian tradition, they talk about human exceptionalism. So that humans are exceptional and humans are like the special or the culminating creation of God. And uh, in one sense, we don't disagree with them. That there is something special in the 11th canto also in the Uddha Gita says that the Lord created all living beings, he created human beings and he felt satisfied. But what is special is in one sense in the, in, in the Christian worldview, it is humanity is raised intrinsically above all other species. Whereas in our understanding, yes, there is something special about human beings. But what is special is not that there is an intrinsic difference, but it is a difference in the evolution of consciousness. So there is both an acknowledgement of the difference and at the same time, an acknowledgement of our integral relationship with the natural world. So it's, it's, uh, it's quite a philosophically deep appreciation of the, or a take on the issue. So you'd like to maybe elaborate on that, that decentering the human race, because it seems that yeah. it's which, which as such centered the human race and evolution was they say that we are going to uh, we are going to uh, overthrow the human ego which makes humanity special so mm-hmm. we acknowledge that humanity is special so in one sense you could say evolution says that there is nothing special about humanity and maybe christianity says that evolution is humanity itself is completely special so we say there is something special but what is special is that the soul is more evolved not that only we have souls because I think that is a very important basis for this, this uh, our country, Anukampa, the attitude which you're talking about. Would you like to elaborate on this a little bit? Yeah, I, I really like your formulation that evolution completely uh, removes the specialness of, human, of the human species. Uh, we're nothing more than a face in the ongoing you know, evolution of life. And, and uh, Christianity elevates human beings to having uh, an inherent or intrinsic uniqueness. Uh, but but in, in, in the Vaishnava tradition, uh, the human species, the human being is unique, but for a very specific reason, and one particular reason, and that's it, which is our capacity to uh, uh, consider, to think about, to reflect upon spiritual religious subject matter, philosophical subject matters, and act according to them, right? Our capacity to behave in a dharmic fashion. This is what makes us unique. Amongst the devas, amongst human beings, uh, we we have this unique capacity to make progress on dharma uh, and and, and a situation as well. But but we're not not special in any other way. Our, Our sensual capacity is not special. Uh, it's much better in the case of animals sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, our capacity to enjoy is not special. It's much better in the case of the devas. Our capacity for foresight and vision is not special. Again, the devas are better at that sort of thing. Uh, so so we've, we've physical abilities are not special. I mean, we've got so, actually there's so little that is special about human beings, except for this one thing. And, 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 and that one thing is essentially our capacity to be responsible, to take responsibility. That is what is special. We do not expect responsibility from animals. We have a capacity to be responsible. And, 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 and that capacity is what then uh, um, uh, behooves us, why it behooves us to take care of the environment. That's beautiful. You know, uh, generally we take off my metaphysical inquiry as the dharma, but you, you phrase it in terms of responsibility and then connect with ecology, that's a very, mm, very, you could say, natural and beautiful way of linking it. So because uh, we can regulate ourselves, we can act more responsibly, not just pandering to our, uh, our desires for, say, controlling or dominating the world, enjoying the world. And in many ways, that is that that desire is the 
fuel of the economy that is that is damaging the ecology mm. so we so in that sense the same thing that makes us special among the species can also help us to actually uh, become more to live a eco friendly life and to actually solve the environmental problem at its root yes 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 true <laughs> nice to thank you so you were talking so, about the you want to go ahead with that yeah so so i i i i think our our um our starting point as vision of compassion or karuna uh jive daya i think this is a really good place to begin our our discussion of the theological foundations for ecological care in our in our tradition um and and using that as um a foundation that human beings are not at the center uh when it comes to concerns of life and um you know living life in this world and claiming a space a, a place in this world um but rather we are at the center in terms of our responsibility to express dharm to act dharmically and to express our compassion to others so i think that's a good starting point and 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 from that i want to look at some of the uh metaphysical uh philosophical aspects of our theology that um provide a foundation for ecological care and i think the 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 place to start here is um our firm understanding our theology that god is the world right and and uh, and and this is true in multiple ways in our theology uh, perhaps the most obvious is that of the lord's vishwarupa uh, his cosmic form his universal form that is found in bhagavad gita multiple places in shrimad bhagavatam all the way back in the rigveda with the purusha sukta um the idea that the lord that the world is the body of the lord and this was most beautifully expressed by shri pad ramanujacharya uh in his un- philosophical understanding that um that the world is is sharira shariri bhava right that the world is the sharira of the lord is the body of the lord Uh, but it's found in gaudiya vaishnava theology again and again and again um that that uh, that the world is the body of god uh but 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 also in gaudiya vaishnava theology of shakti right our our understanding that the world is the energy of the lord and because of the idea of achintya bheda bheda that the energy is different but also not different from the lord this idea of non difference the energy is non difference from the lord is something that is very valuable for ecological understanding because we recognize that when we interact with the world we're interacting with the lord his energy uh his presence and and the way in which we interact with the world uh reflects the way in which we have a relationship with krishna right that exploitation of the material world is exploitation of krishna's energy and because the energy is non different from the energetic therefore we are misbehaving in our relationship to krishna as well so there's the vishwarupa there's shakti theology and then there's the uh there's the um the very nice understanding of krishna as the cause of the world uh that there are different kinds of causes right there's nimitta karana and upadana karana that krishna is the efficient cause of the world the, he is the one who creates the world and that understanding is shared across every religious tradition it's a shared across any theistic uh especially monotheistic tradition that god creates the world no doubt it, here we might give the analogy of the lord as the one who is um you know like a like a someone constructing something building something he he builds this world he takes the parts and pieces and they they emanate from him he takes various forms to manipulate the elements and create a home for us to live in but that is only half of the creation story right that's only half he is not only the creator he is also the creation he is not only the nimitta karana he is also the upadana karana the substantive cause 
of this world. He is the substance of the world. And this is something that is held as a fundamental pillar of Gaudiya Vaishnav theology and several other Vaishnav groups also, that Krishna is the substance of the world. He's not just the potter who makes the pot, he's also the clay, which is the pot. Both are aspects of the Lord, the ways in which Krishna interacts with the world. So when we interact with the world and the way in which we interact with the world reflects how we behave, how we are behaving, our, reflects our relationship with the Lord himself. And it affects him. It reflects that relationship and it affects that relationship uh, also in the way that we treat the world. That's uh, wonderful. That's a lot of points. Maybe we can flesh them out one by one. So in terms of, so I would like to ask how you want to take this discussion because there are two ways we can say that one is that is the, the, the particular insight uh, distinctive to Gaudiya Vaishnava theology as contrasted to say, either other Vaishnava or Vedic theologies or other religious theologies? Or uh, means do we want to go into the direction of the comparative theology or because how we could focus on how this particular worldview uh, helps uh, address the challenge? And of course, so we, maybe we can do both, but uh, because each of these points can be elaborated in many different ways. So if you consider, for example, the, the idea of the universe as the body of God. So is this something which is uh, there in other traditions? Do you want, you want to explore in that direction? or How would you like to do this? Um, yes, I mean, we can say briefly that the idea is present in other traditions. And my purpose is not to say that this is uh, that any of the points we're making is, is unique or distinctive or, or not found elsewhere. I mean, like you said, that would be a whole different discussion in terms of comparative religion and, and looking at religions in comparative perspective. So my purpose is not so much to, to say what is unique, but rather to say this is a pillar of our tradition, which influences or should influence how we relate to the environment. Um, and, and how exactly it influences um, uh, our environmental outlook is something that we need to develop this idea further in order to get to that point. This is just, this is just the, 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 um, the, the seed. The, it's, it's just the skeleton that, that we need to, like you said, we need to flesh it out more and, and understand it better. Yeah, that, that's a good approach. But then, then maybe what we can do is, rather than going into comparative theology, we could just contrast the insight that our tradition offers with the contemporary understanding, whether it is the materialistic understanding or maybe the mainstream theological understanding of a particular tradition or whatever it is. So that way we are not going into, uh, going into like a comparative theology where we are talking about you know, why this, this particular insight is valuable in the current setting. Will that be helpful? That's excellent. Yes. Mm. Excellent. So now you mentioned three points. Should we start with the Virat Rupa uh, conception? Or how do you want yes. to? Okay. Yes, that's good. So if we, we consider the, the idea of the universe as the body of the Lord, this seems to be there, uh, there both in the Bhagavad Gita, there's a, this theophany, uh, the revelation in the Bhagavad Gita and the Bhagavatam, it is quite prominent in the second chapter, second canto, it is there, but apart from that, also, it's there in almost every major prayer. So it's quite a central idea in the Bhakti in the Bhagavatam itself. So maybe theologically, what does it mean? So Prabhupada say we, maybe we can discuss that from our theological perspective and then see how it relates with us. The idea that God this universe is the body of God. Now, we are not using that in a, we're not saying that in a, a literal or a pantheistic sense, that this is God, but you could say this is also God. This is not, this is not profane as compared to God being sacred. Is that the emphasis? And we can, we can, this is also sacred because this is also God. And through this, we can also attain the transcendental awareness, tra transcendental consciousness through nature. Is that the purpose of uh, the discussion about the universal form in the Bhagavatam? 
Yeah, there's there's a there's a, 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 an ontological element to this as to this discussion. There's an epistemological aspect to it, and there's a relational side to it, right? So uh, ontologically speaking, uh, yes, we recognize that everything is is not different from the Lord, right? It's part of the Lord's energy, or it's part of His body, um, and so. Uh, ontologically speaking, uh, the Lord is present. There's not a strong uh, d- division between creator and creation. And, and that immediately needs to change our perspective ecologically because this, e- the, the world is now no, not merely a resource to be exploited, a resource that is other than us and other than the Lord, right? We, it's, it's not, it's not uh, something that is uh, merely separate that it is actually incorporated in the being of the Lord and in our being as well, because we're in that same category of being the Lord's energy, a different kind of energy, but no doubt still there's an aspect of non-difference there. So there's an ontological dimension, but then there is also an epistemological uh, uh, dimension, namely that now the world serves as a way for us to understand and appreciate the Lord. And this is clear in Bhagavad Gita in chapter 11, where Arjun, after chapter 10, he says, okay, Krishna, I want to know you. That's his concern, to know Krishna. Who are you? Uh, And that's what prompts the theophany. I want to see you. I want to know you. Um, So there's an epistemological side. And Prabhupada often said, when we see the beauty of the natural world, then we reflect on the fact that, oh, if the creation is so beautiful, then how beautiful must be the creator? Right? So in other words, the creation reflects something of the creator. It provides us epistemic access, uh, a knowledge uh, of, of the Lord. And then there's the relational, the ontological and epistemic. In, when, we, when we speak of bhakti, right, then the ontological and epistemic, we can't stop with that. Those two have to lead to uh, uh, relationality. That it has to affect our relationship. That's the point of bhakti. Otherwise, we, we remain only on the level of sat and chit, uh, ontology and uh, epistemology. We need to move to the point of ananda, or we need to move from karma and jnana to bhakti. And bhakti says, okay, this knowledge now, iti matva bhajante ma. One who knows this, if you have this knowledge, then it's going to affect my relationship with the Lord, right? And that's, that, that is what the step that is so crucial to an eco-theology is to say, okay, now that I know that this creation is the Lord, therefore my behavior towards this creation is going to be uh, changed. It's going to be affected. It's going to be uh, transformed in, in how I relate to this creation because I know I'm relating to the Lord. Just like we ended on this point last time, right? Prabhupada saying that, that uh, 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 reprimanding devotees because the light bulb was left on or the water tap was dripping, right? So that knowledge that this is Krishna's energy affects a change in our behavior, in our, in our relationality uh, to, the, uh, to, to, the, to the Lord. And, and that's, the, that's, the, that's the turn of bhakti. Up to that point, uh, bhakti is not introduced. Bhakti means that our knowledge leads to a change in relationship. Mm, beautiful. So what, what you're saying is that, again, going back to the earlier point, that if we internalize this worldview, then naturally the environmental consciousness will, will be an expression of that. So if we see that now, do, do we want to also consider from a historical perspective whether that has been a fact that... Mm-hmm. Because sometimes uh, one of the challenges that comes up is that uh, it's a whole different subject. That we say that we talk Pandita, Samadarshina, that we talk about the equality of everyone at the spiritual level. But at the same time, within the, within the broad Vedic, in, Vedic Indian tradition, the caste system came up, which was quite a rigid hierarchy, which led to discrimination. So in one sense, uh, the, theo- the theology may be great, may be egalitarian, but the lived reality was very was not similar. 
and we can that is a whole different subject but do we see within indian history any evidence that there was a awareness eco friendliness so so th- there there is uh, this is a very important point and i think we touched on it in the last conversation but it bears repeating here which is that there is no necessary connection between theology and praxis between theology and action in the world um the, if if this were the case if there was somehow some inherent or necessary uh what movement from one to the other then the world would be a perfect place right because i, I mean every religion's theology is wonderful i i the, the principles are beautiful they're really important and they're well suited to living life ethically and dharmically in this world mm-hmm. but and 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 the vast vast majority of the world's population is religious so if if there was a clear uh you know segue from theology to practice then the world would be a perfect place we would not be discussing these issues at all so even though this may seem like an obvious point i think it's important to bear in mind that throughout the history of any tradition including our own there will be moments of of which we we should rightly be very proud and we should see how our theology has been placed into action and other moments where we can see that as human beings we have failed our wonderful uh uh divine revelation that we have received right so so th- th- there's no there's no necessary connection between the two and and so if we looked at gaudiya vaishnav history we would find examples of both uh, uh especially because uh, the gaudiya vaishnav tradition is revealed uh to us especially in this age of kali so most definitely uh we have not been perfect in our practice through history but there's also some very bright spots and uh it, before the modern era it's safe to say uh you know this is true across the board but before the modern era the language of ecology and environment was not something that was described or spoken of it doesn't become an explicit concern in any scripture or text uh but yet the lifestyles and behaviors of of um of various peoples and civilizations in different parts of the world were either by design or of necessity uh very much um in in touch with the natural environment more so than our industrialized civilization allows for us today um so whether that that was a conscious decision whether that was out of necessity only uh whether that was inadvertent uh who is to say but the point is we have something to learn from the past oh okay that's a I, yeah we had discussed this last time that uh basically how a, how a theology is lived depends on its living teachers and how they uh, you, we can draw from almost any sacred text whatever whatever we want to justify our particular agenda or our particular it could agenda has a negative connotation or address the particular issue that we are so depending on who is leading at what time and who is dealing with what different things could be highlighted so yeah so in this in this sense a historical examination may not be the most constructive way to actually evaluate the merits of what a theology can contribute in today's world hmm. it, it 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 is constructive in the sense that it provides us with exam, examples and exemplars of both positive and negative uh, applications for our purposes i'll i'll just add that that yes it is true that we can deploy a, a scripture or theology as we see fit but it's within limits as in no text or theology is infinitely pliable um or or plastic it it th- th- there's a point at which one has moved beyond what is a reasonable understanding of the text when it's no longer a reasonable or logical interpretation of the text when it's no longer a consistent with prior tradition or parampara uh with prior acharyas so there is a sense in which one can one one reaches limits on this but yes within a certain boundary what you're saying i agree with very much that 
that uh, it really depends on the uh, commentator, on the uh, hermeneut, on the interpreter in terms of how they uh, choose to understand, what they choose to emphasize, uh, and, and how they choose to, to, um, to deploy it. And, and we can give many, many examples of that fact. There are statements in Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita that one could uh, completely misconstrue uh, in, uh, or apply in a, in a way that would be terrible, right? Uh, but, but fortunately, we don't do that. Uh, if we want to do, we certainly could. Mm, true. That makes sense. So, yeah, then if you look at the Virat Rupa, if more and more people understood this idea that nature is sacred, that, then that would inspire them to act more respectfully towards it. Yes, yes, but 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 this is insufficient. As in, we haven't yet go- gotten to what I think is the most brilliant move from a Vaishnava perspective. That this is just the foundation. That God is the world, right? It's the starting point. And yes, it it should and must affect our behavior uh, towards the environment. But there's something yet more powerful that is coming. That I think is the most more important thing. Or Gaudiya Vaishnavas. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so th- this is just the foundation. Shakti theology, uh, um, uh, Vishwarupa, uh, the Upadana Karana. This is the foundation that comes from Vedanta philosophy, right? That the Lord is creation. Shakti Parinam Vada. This is Vedanta. And Vedanta is the foundation of our tradition. Uh, Vedanta is where we begin. Uh, but it's not the ending point, right? We have to... We, we start with the Vedantic principles, that, but then we move to the relationality that is part, that is the heart of bhakti. And, and that's the move that we still have not done yet. Shall we proceed there? Yeah, please, please. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so if, we, if we accept the starting point that God is the world, uh, he's also different from the world, but in a very su- substantial way, uh, the Lord is uh, uh, identified as the the material cause as the the uh, non different from the energy that is this material world. Um, so, if God is this world, and for uh, Vaishnavas, for Gaudiya Vaishnavas, uh, God is a personal being, right? He is not impersonal. The Lord is personal, and therefore, this world also needs to be seen and related to in personal ways. Right? The world is also personal. So it's very simple logic. God is the world. God is personal. Therefore, the world is also personal. Now, what do I mean by personal? This is, this is I think, is such an important insight uh, that is important for us and for others that um, when we speak of the world as personal, when we look at how Vaishnavas understand the world, Every aspect of the world is personal, is a person, is a living, breathing, conscious, aware, individual person. Whether we look at rivers, every river is a person, a devi, a goddess, um, uh, a a living being, a mother, uh, Yamuna Maya, Ganga Maya, who we relate to, we should relate to as persons. The trees, how many times have you seen in any Indian village or even in a city, right? A, a tree with a, with a face mask on or a sari wrapped around or uh, that tree is, is the embodiment of a deity, whether it's Mahadev or it's Lord Vishnu or it's a Devi, most commonly is, is Devi. Uh, uh, trees are persons. You look at even s- certain forms of stones and rocks even, Right, uh, like Shalagram Shila, like Govardhan Shila, uh, these are persons. If you look at uh, the clouds in the sky and the rains, we understand that this is a person who is controlling and in- with whom we are interacting when we uh, when we live through a storm or through a major occurrence uh, of, of some weather event. When we look at the earth as a whole. We know this is a person, Bhumi Devi, uh, with whom we are uh, acting and interacting. And, and even there is a, 
a prayer to offer, to request forgiveness from Bhumi Devi for us constantly touching her with our feet and, and stepping upon her and causing a burden. We see throughout Bhagavatam how Bhumi Devi is personified uh, and comes to the Lord for pleas of help uh, when we human beings put her through so much suffering. Everywhere we turn, we see a world that is personal, uh, that is individual, uh, and, and, um, and, 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 and that comes directly from our understanding of who God is, right? That if the Lord is a person, his energy is a person, everything we relate to is personal uh, in, in this world. The, the most beautiful example of this, I think, is, is in Srimad Bhagavatam in the story of the Prachetas, uh, where uh, the Prachetas, uh, ten, 10 wonderful brothers uh, who share great love for each other. And they go, they've been asked to rule the world and to populate the world. And, uh, and they go into a, a deep lake uh, to do meditation for 10,000 years to develop the spiritual strength and capacity to uh, rule the world nicely. Uh, and when they emerge after those many years from the water, we know that the earth is, um, uh, is, is uh, completely covered by trees. Uh, and it, uh, um, the Acharyas explain that there is no place for human habitation or agriculture. And their job is to be kings, right? And to provide space for human beings. Kings rule over human beings and so facilitate them. And so when they see the ways in which trees have overrun this earth, they become uh, very angry, very upset. And their anger takes hold of them. And with their yogic power, they shoot fire from their eyes and begin to burn the earth from the surface of the trees, uh, uh, burn the surface of the earth uh, to rid it of, of all the trees there. And, and um, I, 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 I remember reading this story in particular and thinking, what are the ecological implications of this story uh, from, you know, one, uh, uh, these great uh, Vaishnavas and great uh, kings and, and sages just trying to rid the world of trees. A as their anger goes out of control, uh, then, um, then uh, Brahma himself comes to protect uh, these trees and, and, and to calm them down and says, please look at what you are doing. Why are you doing this gratuitous killing of the trees and destroying them? Uh, you've got, you know, you've, you, you need to take care of human beings and you need to clear some space that, that every human settlement needs to do. But this is going too much. This is going over the top. Uh, don't do this activity, right? And, and, and the thing is, he provides a logical argument for a not killing not uh, cutting down, burning those trees. But then what he does after that, I think is, is just as significant. Uh, you recall? He, he, um, he then tells the trees to offer their daughter, Marisha, in marriage to the Prachetas. And the Prachetas accept. And by doing that, what has Brahmaji done? He has transformed the trees from an expendable resource to a person with, with whom the Prachetas have, uh, have to have a relationship. They have to contend with the fact that these are persons, right? Now, it's not just burning down trees. They're burning down their own father-in-law, isn't it? They've developed a relationship of kinship with the trees through marriage. Mm -hmm. And that has now turned the trees from a faceless resource to a personal entity with whom they have to a relationship. We know this from so many studies that human beings can destroy things when they don't have a face, when they are faceless. The only way to slaughter an animal for meat is if you do not see that animal as a person. No American can eat dogs, right? Because dogs have a face. They have a relationship. They are seen as persons. 
We speak of dogs in the United States as he and she, not as it. As soon as you put a face on something, you cannot destroy it. You cannot kill it. As soon as you make it personal. And so this is, this is, a, 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 this is, this is a, such a valuable resource that we have in our theology, the idea that everything in this world is personal and therefore uh, uh, deserves to have to be treated a, in relationship, not just as resource. Mm. That's a beautiful thought. At, uh, the impl- again, you're talking about, again, I think this dynamic of the, how the ontological affects the relational. That's, it's a constant dynamic that is going on. So this, uh, in, in traditional society, one of the ways to have peace was between the warring kings, if they have some kind of uh, blood rela- marriage, marital relationship, that actually would seal peace. So that dynamic being applied over here, is this super? I never thought in those terms in that particular past time. So, just one point I wanted to maybe qualify or clarify either way that uh, it's not that necessarily seeing the personal uh, will always take away violence because sometimes when people want to take revenge, they remember the face of the person they want to take revenge and that keeps going on in their mind. But what we can say is that. In that case, they feel that that person has hurt me and therefore I have to get back at that person. But in the, in, so you could say it's more of a, like a very conscious and intentional uh, aggression, but the casual nonchalant nonchalant destruction, that will not happen if we see the personal. And in, in many ways, that's what happens when we, when we depersonalize nature. This is a very valuable point, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. If you, if, if you look at how Prabhupada spoke about slaughtering of animals, for example, he said, even in the Vedic system, there is facility. If you must, if you insist on eating animals, then you kill the animal, you offer it to Goddess Kali. You say in the ear of the animal that I am killing you today, one day you will kill me. Mamsa, this is my ansha, this is my my body that I'm, my limb that I'm cutting off here, right? We, we are, we are, we are, there's connection between us. He said, but this slaughterhouse business is simply demonic, right? So, so the point is you're right, as in even the personal can allow for violence, but it is not the gratuitous nonchalant violence, as you said, that, 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 that is the most destructive. I, I mean, the, the, the animal industry uh, is, uh, f- uh, the industrial farming is, is uh, of, of animals is, is one of the most, uh, w- w- one of the top producers of, of environmental destruction on all different levels, water pollution, air pollution, carbon, uh, uh, you know, greenhouse gases, all of that. And, and it comes from this mass scale of gratuitous violence that is a product a factory farming, right? So that even if someone says, okay, I'm going to raise an animal and then slaughter it with my own hands after offering it to goddess Kali, still that is better because at least there is some personal relationship there. Beautiful. Yeah. So like what you talked about dogs earlier uh, in America, that's very, that was very much there for cows and uh, other animals in India and uh, the idea that when we uh, we could say we can either objectify or we can personify so when we based on what we do naturally the mode of interaction will vary so now are we also we can decide how much you want to explore this uh, area that from an ontological perspective, when we say nature is a person, there are quite a few, you could say, complex uh, challenges that come us. What do we mean there by that? If you see from that particular pastimes perspective, uh, the Prachita's pastime, is it every tree is a person and then there is a deity who is a person who is over in charge of the trees? Is every is every, if a river is a person, 
what does it mean is a river has a soul and the body is different from the soul with respect to trees it's a little easy to understand so is this personification at one level uh, ontological reality in the same way as it applies for us humans because we do say that there are 8.4 million species and rivers are not exactly one of the species actually there there's something i i want to say in response to that uh, which i i think you bring up an important point which is that um that um you know uh, i think i mentioned in the last podcast that david haberman has this book uh is called people trees and uh, it, it's spelled p e o p l e people trees because trees are people but it's also a pun because people trees in india are considered to be sacred right the people uh, riksha uh, and so um there he he talks about his experience traveling the length and breadth of india and everywhere he would go he would ask people this question in hindi in north india he was traveling ye vriksh kaun hai who is this tree and he said not once in his travels did anyone look at him like he was crazy like if you if you put this question to someone say in in uh, in in my town here where i live and asked who is this tree just pointed to some tree and asked who is this tree maybe it's a big tree in the botanical garden who is this tree they would basically think i don't know english right they would say no 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 what is this tree you're asking what kind of tree it is uh, this is an oak tree uh, but that's not what i'm asking right i'm asking who is this tree and that question uh, he, uh um david haberman he reflects uh, uh how that question never n- no one ever looked at him like he was crazy or it was the most normal question in the world and people gave answers ranging from i don't know to this is this devi or this is this person or or simply the name of the of the of the tree this is a a a, a, a bargad tree or ashwatthama tree or something like that right uh, so but the 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 pronoun used was who not what and and i and i think um i think the answer we, is the same but the yes. pronoun is different okay yes that's nice okay yeah and 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 so he also describes in his experience how he he saw so many places where the tree was growing out of the middle of a home or out of the middle of a building or a building was built in a very odd shape to avoid a tree right these things are quite common and they're becoming less common as india becomes industrialized and um very modernized and so on uh, but the 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 point being that you know regardless of how exactly we see the ontology the atma and the body and so on and so forth uh, the reality is that personality is there right personhood is there sometimes we may speak of ganga devi or yamuna devi as as not an ordinary jiva but uh, she is a sakhi yamuna devi is a sakhi in krishna's leela and and uh, uh, the vallabha tradition speaks of her as krishna's patrani his queen um so we may speak of them in different ways and other common trees are just ordinary jivas they're not devis or goddesses some trees may be special uh, they may be manifestations of lord shiva or so on so there may be different ways of understanding the ontology in a specific circumstance but the general principle remains the same right that personhood is something that um pervades the way that vaishnavas see the world and we have to draw upon that personhood theology that personal theology in order to um behave in a certain way with the world right and to act in a certain way to recognize that we have a responsibility towards the other that this the trees the rocks the rivers they are also para when we speak of par dukh dukhi they are also in the category of para and we should not come into the trap of thinking para is only the human being hmm okay that's beautifully put and uh, 
what this would mean is that uh, we can be again we could say that we are taking care of ecology also not simply from a utilitarian perspective but from in a more intrinsic perspective also it's like we go back to the example of a dog it's not that people those who see a dog as a person they care for the dog because the dog is going to guard my house that is hardly there in the mind of people it's I mean, that's one part of it so we are there is within the materialistic world view also there are some people who are highly ecologically conscious but they are simply concerned that this is this is our planetary home if it gets damaged we will have nothing to live we will have nowhere to live that's why we have to care for it so this is that's more like a extrinsic concern but this is more intrinsic like we say yes. even in our devotion it is are we loving god or are we loving god himself for who he is or are we loving god for what he gives us so and 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 extrinsic th- this is an important point because extrinsic consider uh, reasons for care can never be sustainable in the long run there's always ways to get around it right so so in other words this river is useful to me therefore as in i need it for drinking water therefore i don't want to pollute it well there's two solutions to that you can stop polluting it or you can just create a better water purification system before you drink it right so so when when you speak of something in a utilitarian way there's always a way around care uh for uh, another way to exploit that gets around the problem even this is this world is our home therefore we need to care for it uh, there's only one earth but they, at this very moment there are there are billionaires who have a vision of inhabiting other worlds because they see a future where this world becomes uninhabitable right and so let's go explore other lands there there's always a way around the extrinsic considerations it's only the intrinsic which will lead towards long term sustainable care because it changes it changes our care right and and again that's a vision of principle unless you change what's inside you will not change what's outside so extrinsic considerations they're just attempting to change what's outside you need the river for recreation you need the river for fishing you need the river for drinking water so therefore you should protect the river that's that that is going to work only as long as the need is there and someone can have multiple arguments i'll just purify the water i don't eat fish the water is not useful for recreation i don't care about recreation because i'm still struggling to eat find enough food to eat right there's so many arguments against that but if you say that the river is your mother and your mother is sick because of you and it is your responsibility to take care of her there's no argument around that mm. that's beautiful and that's as a so maybe we can as you introduce a new a new dynamic in the in the viewing of nature as a person that you're not just seeing nature as a person but nature as a mother and then prabhupad would use that uh, with respect to cows that you, you take care of the cow she's like a mother you don't just so the the dairy farmers who take care of cows and then send them to slaughterhouse they to some extent are not having that personal relationship so this, is this metaphor of mother nature as mother also distinctive or is there something distinctive in the way we our tradition understand this you want to go in that direction now or you want to develop this point further uh so so i can say a few words about the the mother uh idea um but but then i want to move uh further into the heart of the tradition so we 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 started in our theological explorations at a very um basic level of ontology right that that all vedantists would agree with or most vedantists would agree with and then we moved specifically to the idea that god is a person the world is personal and then i want to move deeper into the heart of gaudiya vaishnav theology so that's the direction we're we're heading in essentially 
but but just to say a few words about what you said, which is that the the idea of, of nature as mother is uh, is is quite widely um, uh, appreciated and held and understood around the world. Um, it's it's one of the fundamental ways in which human beings have have related um, to 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 the to to the natural world is in terms of uh, seeing it as a sustaining nourishing caring uh force uh the chat but but that's a double-edged sword because mothers are also very much expected to sacrifice their whole lives for their children and so in the same way we've expected uh, all these natural elements rivers and and the earth to sacrifice constantly for our own misbehaviors and sinful activities so we have to we have to um uh, be careful that we are also recognizing our dharmic duty in relation to the mother, right? Matra Devo Bhava, that we have a relationship that we need to, uh, okay, we, we, we're grown up children now. We have to also have a responsibility to take care of our mothers and make sure that she is healthy, especially if, if her, the lack of health is because of us. And I think the, the, the most uh, striking examples of this in, in, in Vaishnav literature come from the repeated instances of Bhumi Devi going crying to Lord Vishnu and saying, please, the earth is just, people are exploiting me without end, right? Uh, these kings and rulers and, and, um, and uh, greedy materialists are, are exploiting me endlessly. Please uh, do something about it. Relieve the burden of the earth. So we have explicit descriptions of how we as human beings can cause so much burden on Bhumi Devi that she has to take extreme measures uh, for her health. Um, uh, uh, and, and we see this in the accounts of, of Lord Krishna's appearance, Ram, Lord Ramachandra's appearance, and most distinctively in the appearance of Lord Varaha Devi, where he comes specifically for Bhumi Devi. But what I find so beautiful in that story of Varaha Dev is how tenderly the Lord uh, relates to Bhumi Devi. Um, yes, he saves her, so he's a savior, but she's also his consort, right? And we see this most clearly in the Sri Vaishnav tradition that worships um, Bhumi Devi, uh, uh, Sri Devi and Bhu Devi as the consorts of the Lord. And in the form, and there's beautiful murtis of Varaha Dev in South India, where she is not in the form of a globe, but in the form of a woman who is seated upon the lap of Varaha Dev. And she is the Lord's consort, right? And, and, and very dear to the Lord. And imagine, imagine how Krishna would feel if we provided pain to his consort, right? If we injured her. I mean, he feels terribly about it. And that's why he comes running to this earth again and again and again, just as a husband would come running to a wife who has been injured by another. Right? You see that, that relationship. And Bhagavatam specifically says that the Lord is very concerned that in the battle, in his battle with Hiranyaksha, Bhumi Devi will become a casualty, that she will become afraid, that she's scared of the situation and places her very tenderly, very gently upon the surface of the causal ocean, uh, in order of, of the Garbhodak ocean, in order to to uh, take care of her uh, nicely. So, so it's a very sweet, very tender relationship that the Lord has. And again, we have to remember that when we relate to this earth, uh, that 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 what a, a, a you know she she is our mother, uh, and and she is the Lord's consort. And there is no way we are pleasing Krishna if we are committing violence to His consort. Right? It's just, it's an impossible uh, idea to think that Krishna is going to be happy as we, as we injure Hu Devi and we try to worship him. It's not going to work. Beautiful. Mm. So now, uh, just one quick question before we move ahead. That So are we talking about two distinct things over here that as we share the bhakti wisdom and more and more people become bhaktas, uh, then they will naturally take care of 
environmental consciousness that is one way the environmental consciousness and eco care can happen or the other is that even if people don't accept the whole bhakti worldview and bhakti practices entirely but these elements of the bhakti worldview can inspire people maybe they will accept only this part and that can give a new intellectual or relational impetus for them to uh, care more for the environment and how, how are we talking about or are we talking more in terms of building a world view is my so, very very nice very nice question bro um chaitanya charitamrita says that when shri chaitanya mahaprabhu came he brought a flood of bhakti uh, with him that covered the earth right yes um and 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 drowned the world in this bhakti now with any kind of flood some people will be more affected by it than others some i mean this is a a backwards analogy where the negative is being made positive uh but it, some people will drown in that flood of love of god uh, others will get their feet wet and others will simply see it and get affected mm. nature of a flood is that everyone is affected but in different ways right not everyone is affected in the same way so if our goal is simply that everyone must drown it's not going to happen at least not right away right is some people are going to drown others are going to be transformed in their own they'll continue with their lifestyle they'll continue with their religions they'll continue with their basic approach but they will be changed they will be affected they will benefit from being touched by those transcendental waters right um so we have to think of this flood from mahaprabhu in a very broad sense uh and recognize that we have something very significant to contribute to the world and that contribution is not limited to merely everyone shaving up it's limit it's 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 limitless that contribution is lim- mahaprabhu's effect is going to be limitless right uh, in in its scope and it's going to come in all different ways in all different directions so we have to have a broad vision uh, for engaging with the world um, otherwise we we are we are uh, we are being limited by our own narrowness of vision mm. that's nicely put it could i was thinking of some parallels in some ways a lot of people adopt buddhistic values without necessarily like the aval uh, without necessarily endorsing the buddhist world view many of them don't even know the whole buddhist world view or like yoga has been adopted without many people knowing the yogic world view yes. and yes that may lead to some utilitarianism and but in some ways it's better that people take care of their health by more natural and holistic means rather than by simply pumping chemicals into their bodies so we if we can contribute to raising consciousness of people whether it is all the way from tamas to shuddha sattva or it is even from tamas to rajas or from rajas to sambhav towards sattva that is also a valuable contribution yes i mean to be honest bro when when we say we're we're raising someone from tamas to sattva the reality is that when we raise someone to the level of sattva or even to the transcendental level we're already getting them at the level of rajas right so they they arrive at our door sometimes already at the level of sattva and then we we take them to the level of 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 engaging on the transcendental level it's rarely rarely are we i don't know if we're ever part of a soul's journey from the start to finish right i mean what we say is oh we we made a devotee uh, the 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 reality is we got someone who was already 75% of a devotee we help them cross to the next level so then we say we made a devotee but someone else did all the hard work of bringing them from 0 to 75% right beautiful effort yes yeah. isn't it so someone else did all the hard work to get them to the point at which we met them so so wh- why should we not find value in getting someone from 0 to 25% right from from just learning how from from going from half killing animals to fully killing animals fully like in the story of nagadi 
Is, is there no credit in that? Of course there is, because that person who recognizes the pain of another jiva, he will be more uh, acceptable to appreciating the importance of, of, of ahimsa and of karuna. So getting from zero to 25 is just as important as getting from 75 to 100. Mm. Beautiful. So then uh, we need to broaden our understanding of what, what sharing Krishna consciousness or sharing or basically sharing spirituality or spiritual wisdom means. It, is, it can't always be quantified in terms of tangible results in a particular way. Yeah, so it's beautiful. Sometimes we say that in our outreach, uh, don't, I mean, it's difficult to make people interested in spirituality, better to find people who are already interested in spirituality. But then we don't ask the question, why have they become interested in spirituality? <laughs> some, not just some circumstantial event that prompted a spiritual in- inquiry, but there could also be their upbringing, somebody did something for them either in this life or in a previous life. Yeah, very wonderful. If we are in one sense reaping the fruits that are of the seeds that others have sown, then we also need to sow some seeds for others to reap the fruits also. Yeah. Hmm. Well, one of my, I mean, this is a whole topic that we could we could discuss, but but uh, I'll I'll just add one thing that one of my childhood mentors, uh, Ganapati Swami, uh, he he's a Sanyasi Prabhupada's disciple who spent his life distributing books by traveling in his camper, his RV, from one remote, and he always goes to remote places, remote college town to another, distributing books, and, 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 and various places. He sets up a book table and distributes Prabhupada books. And one of the things I remember he told me, in, again in my childhood, it stuck with me a lot. He said, every person almost whom he gives a book to, if he spends the time to talk to them, he realizes that somewhere they have eaten Krishna Prasad, right? Somewhere they have heard the holy name. Now, whoever gave them that Prasad, if that person was results-oriented, then they would have never given them the Prasad because 99% of Prasad distribution has no immediate tangible result connected to it other than the person saying, oh, this tastes good, Mm -hmm. right? And yet he would get these people who had eaten prasad sometimes thousands of miles away and he would give them a book. And that would be another step, right? Another step in their spiritual progress. And who knows, one of those people who got a book, sometimes they would show up at our temple, right? So my, my point is it's, it's, it's a... We have to see the holistic picture of the jiva's journey. Not just that sliver of the jiva's journey that we have the eyes to see. Because our vision of the eternal journey of the jiva is like one snapshot, one moment in in a person's journey. And and we have to say, no, I'm participating in this moment because Krishna has asked me to participate. He's given me this opportunity. This is my seva. But the whole journey is neither in my vision nor my control. So in that sense, we have to be detached. Beautiful. Yeah, we can... It's quite presumptuous to say that we've made somebody a devotee. It is, <laughs> even from a devotional perspective, so many people, devotees contributed to it and what to speak of others. So yeah, it's... We, in one sense, we have... How can we... we put it, we have a defined finishing line. Yes. <laughs> then that person has gone on a long journey aided by many people. We just help that person go across the finishing line and say, oh, I brought this person. <laughs> like that. Yes. And, 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 and what's even more funny is that it's a finish line that is self-defined. That is not actually the finish line at all. Right? As in, as in who is to say that, that that line is actually the finish line? Suppose we take them aft, uh, across the finish line, then 10 years down the road, they, they then give up their practice of bhakti. Mm. So was that the finish line? Of course it wasn't the finish line. That was just a, a milestone in their progress. What is the actual finish line? Right? That, that it's, it's a self-defined finish line. That is, that is you know, 
it, it's it's socially useful as a as a finish line. But from a, a a bhakti perspective, that's I mean maybe when we learn how to boil milk for uh, to assist Shrimati Radharani, then maybe we can call that a finish line. Maybe, right? But but even there, even there, the 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 every devotee in Vrindavan is growing in their relationship with Krishna. Right? Is progressing in their relationship with Krishna. So so what is the finish line? We have to ask ourselves anyway. <laughs> if, if we, 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 we take credit to, to bring someone to the point of diksha, right? But then if if five years down the road they give up their practice of their vows, will we take credit for that also? No. <laughs> we don't want to take credit for that. <laughs> you see what I mean? It's we take an arbitrary snippet from someone's long journey in bhakti, mm. and we take that as our credit, as our marker of success. But but how about the person who helps the devotee recover after their their loss of practice? They take diksha, then they leave, and then the, someone comes and inspires them to continue again. Should that person not get credit for bringing them to the so-called finish line? Mm. So we could say that uh, in many ways, I'm just trying to bring this topic back to the ecology, ecology discussion. <laughs> so in expanding our conception of outreach is itself a huge topic and what you have brought is a very, very vital and uh, uh, I mean, how should I put it? Like a paradigm altering uh, insight. Maybe as you said, we can discuss it separately. But we, I was just thinking in terms of a progression. So we could say that there are people who are already ecologically interested and we can help them on their spiritual journey uh, steps forward, even if they're not necessarily come, going to come to that finish line which we socially or institutionally define. And there are people who may already cross the finish line but they may not be environmentally conscious. And then our understanding of the philosophy can help them also. So mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in, there's a variety of ways in which this uh, environmental consciousness and devotional consciousness can, can interact in a constructive way. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Very nice. Very nice summary. Yes. You would like to go ahead. I mean, you said yes. that from the heart of the theology till now. Yes, yes. So we have the general Vedantic principle that God is the world, Upadana Karana Shakti. Um, we have the idea that God is personal, which is something that is not just general Vedanta, but specifically a Vaishnava idea that God is a person. And therefore, the world is also personal and we ought to relate to it as such. That was step number two. And now, step number three is the going specifically to a Gaudiya Vaishnava appreciation to the heart of the tradition, that that person, namely Krishna, throughout our Vaish Gaudiya Vaishnava literature, we find that Krishna is happiest in natural surroundings. Our vision of ultimate reality of paradise, of heaven, of the divine, of the ultimate good. That vision which we worship as the highest and we adore and we aspire for is a pastoral vision. It's a vision that is surrounded not by cities and, and industrial development and, and, uh, and huge human accomplishments. It is a vision that is surrounded by rivers, forests, mountains, um, animals. Krishna, the Krishna we worship is a coward boy. He's the, the part of his life that is more, most dear to us. Aradhyo Bhagavan Vrajeshatanayas is spent in Braj, where Krishna is a coward. He does leela after leela that involves the protection of the people, the forests, the rivers, the land of Vrindavan. 
If you just look at the accounts of Krishna's protection of the forests and his relationship to the forest, it makes actually a very sweet study of the Srimad Bhagavatam. There's the, the, the account of Krishna walking through the forest and praising the beauty of the forest and the ways in which it's relating to Lord Balaram and to himself. Right, the, the trees and how they're bending down and the bees in the forest and the animals. and He's glorifying every aspect of it. The 10th canto has a beautiful description of Vrindavan in the autumn season, showing us the glory of that environment and how that transcendental environment and how it is uh, something that can teach us so much. We see that when uh, Dhenukasura uh, pollutes and controls uh, one of the forests of Vrindavan, Talavan, yes. that Palmyra forest. Krishna defeats him and al- allows all the residents of Vrindavan to access and enjoy the fruits from that forest. We see that on two occasions when the forests is, are being burned by a forest fire, Krishna swallows the forest fire and protects both the people and the forest of Vrindavan. We see how when the river uh, Yamuna is being polluted by Kaliya, killing, uh, of of course, endangering the residents of Vrindavan, but also the animals, also the fish, the birds that fly over the the, the river uh, are are, are killed by its fumes. The, The plants and trees on its banks are drying up, poisoned by that toxins. Krishna jumps into that river to remove uh, uh, Kaliya and his, his poisonous hoods. Again and again, we find that our vision of who Krishna is, our Acharya's vision of who Krishna is, is connected with the fruits, forests, flowers, rivers, gems, trees, and the natural environment of Braj. And if this point isn't entirely clear, even after this, we can make it even clearer by contrasting, by seeing the opposite, how more or less every account of demons in Srimad Bhagavatam is connected to destruction of the natural environment. That may not be their primary purpose, but it is a, a, a um, constant corollary of their behavior. Uh, when there's description of um, uh, Hiranyakashipu, and in that chapter where he tells, in Bhagavatam 7th Canto, he, he tells all his demons, uh, associates, to, to go out and destroy all the, the Brahmins and all the villages and terrorize the world, right? Part of what he specifically instructs them to do is destroy the natural environment to cut down the trees. And Srila Prabhupada has a beautiful purport there uh, in that verse uh, where he says uh, specifically, this is Canto 7, Chapter 2, Text 12. uh, And he says, Prabhupada ends that purport by saying, the cutting of trees simply to manufacture paper for the publication of unwanted literature is the greatest sinful act. He says, trees should be given protection. During its lifetime, a tree should not be cut for industrial enterprises. In Kali Yuga, trees are indiscriminately and unnecessarily cut for industry, in particular for paper mills that manufacture a profuse quantity of paper. Right? And he he's, he's, has this beautiful purport focused specifically just on one word in the verse. It's vrishchata which means they, they cut. That's all it says. Verse, they cut the trees. Right? Uh, anytime you have a description of, of demoniac nature, it's connected with destruction of the environment, uh, with Hiranyaksha destroying the earth and pushing it into the, the, the ocean, uh, the Garbodak ocean. Uh, King Vena and his uh, henchmen are kicking up such a big cloud, so much air pollution, that just like in in Delhi and Beijing and Los Angeles, uh, the, this, this, the light of the sun was occluded right, by 
by that, by that dust. Again and again, we see that in visions of perfection, uh, they are accompanied by uh, descriptions and love and care for the natural environment and in descriptions and visions of uh, demoniac nature, we find with it, accompanying with it, a destruction and callousness towards the natural environment. This goes to the very heart of our tradition. Aradyo Bhagavan Vrajeshatanets Tabdhama Vrindavan Beautiful. There's two, three different points. One is the demons, yeah, they are destroying, disrupting. Kalia's example is so, so vivid in that also, apart from the Nukas and others. So now if you consider at one level, uh, Krishna also lives in Dwarka and uh, Mathura. And there is, uh, there is, it's not intrinsically against urban living. But even the urban living is not disharmonious. Hmm? Whereas uh, the ultimate focus is the, the Vrindavan, which is our highest vision. So our highest vision is a vision of, we could say not just an eco-friendly divinity, but it's almost like an eco-loving divinity. Yes. And you can go even further and say that in one sense, the Dham is non different from the Lord. So it's also, that's an even higher sense of oneness. The earth itself is, uh, is nature itself in one sense God, but in an even more special sense, nature and its full prosperity as manifested in Vrindavan is also God. Yes. Yes. And, 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 and so, so we, have, uh, we have a positive vision to offer, not just uh, asking to avoid the negative, but we have a vision to offer that, that we want to live in this world also, right? As, as Vaishnavas, uh, we understand that our entire lives are an attempt to prepare ourselves to re-enter Krishna's Leela. This is what our life is about. And given the fact that that Leela is the Leela that we want to enter is, as you said, an eco-loving Leela, then does it not behoove us now to live our lives in such a way? To behave in such a way that we too can prepare ourselves to enter that Leela? As, as uh, I've heard Radhanath Maharaj say, if we don't know how to take care of the cows, how will we go back to brunch? Right. As in, as in, well, this is this is the world that we're entering, right? We we may not be cowherds, but we're going to be connected somehow to that pastoral life. We're going to be connected somehow to Yamuna and to the forests of Vrindavan. This is our this is our home. This is our home. Beautifully, uh, I, I beautiful. This is maybe. This is just to me, I just make it a point that in some ways, in a more esoteric aspects of our also tradition also that we talk about emulating the life of the Vrajivasis in a devotional sense mm -hmm. for that is, what is acting as a way of salvation. David Everyone also talks about that. That is Raga, Ragatmika Bhakti and Raganuga Bhakti. So, but that is, well, that is at a very transcendental level, but that same principle of living here the way we live there can also be applied for uh, ecological, eco-friendly living. Mm. It's wonderful. So, we covered a lot of territory. Are there any f uh, further points you would like to, will be left out or you would like to address? No, they, these, these, were the, 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 these were the points that uh, I wanted to uh, make today, cover today. We we started with that idea of paradukha dukhi, of karuna, of ahimsa, as the character of a Vaishnava. And then we worked our way through the theology, from the theology, the idea that God is the world, uh, the world, uh, God is personal, therefore the world is personal. And then not only is the world personal and God personal, but the God we worship is Krishna 
and Krishna is is um, in his two handed form as Nanda Nandan is 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 offering us a vision of of ecological um, harmony and relationship, and and certainly um, you know living in harmony with with nature is not sufficient to go back home, back to Godhead. But I find it difficult to imagine how one could go back to Godhead while still exploiting this material world, right? That's, that's the point, is that if we, if we want to prepare ourselves to actually enter Krishna's Lila, and the prospect that we can do that while still injure, injuring his consort, Hudevi, that we can do that while still living in the world as you know, not as maybe Hiranyakashipu did, but as miniature versions and ra- uh, exploiting the natural world and, and cutting things down and indiscriminately uh, exploiting the resource of the world, that seems like a very implausible idea, that somehow that behavior attitude is compatible with our uh, goal of pure prema bhakti. So I think we've, we've worked our way um, gradually into the heart of Gaudiya Vaishnava uh, theology. And that's uh, more or less where I wanted to leave our discussion or, or bring our discussion to uh, leave our, our listeners with that thought, with that idea. Well, like I can say, you stole my job today. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you, I do a more elaborate summary, but you did a very you say, precise pathway which you charted. So I was just trying to maybe I'll just uh, steal my job back. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> I was just trying to, you know, it could also be a little exercise in itself to how these elements of the Gaudiya Vishnu theology also come together. So at one level, the Virat Rupa is, uh, we started with, uh, with not just Ahimsa, but uh, Karuna, where, where it is more of uh, uh, kindness, care, and that's based on that, so that is uh, related with when we see the Virat Rupa is God as a person, then we that also is. Li- so in one sense, Karuna will be natural if we see nature as personal, and then that will that it'll that will be further intensified. So we can have compassion or care, but love is a far greater emotion, isn't it? Uh, so where if we see the world not only as and life in it not as yes, not different from the Lord, but like very intimately connected with the Lord as it is Vrindavan. So we could say that the relationship with nature will also evolve through these elements which you have mentioned. The, the appreciation, the environmental consciousness itself. And we generally talk about evolution of consciousness, but maybe there could there in the three elements which you mentioned, there is an evolution even in environmental consciousness. Isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. I think that was one of the really nice insights that came from this discussion um, a, a, as a result of, of, of our back and forth was, was that um, th- there's, there's, um, there's different levels of engagement with, uh, with, with the environment. And, and, and that, that aspect that we talked about, how you know, the difference between thinking of the environment in utilitarian terms versus in in, in inherent or intrinsic terms makes such a big difference in terms of how we um, how we relate to it. Um, so there's there's different levels of, of relating to the environment, and I, I appreciated that insight that that you brought up uh, between the extrinsic and the intrinsic approaches uh, to the environment. I think that's very very crucial there. Thank you. Just could say that I'm happy to be of service. You know, it's just very stimulating discussion and not only I'd say stimulating, but it's all intellectually stimulating, but I think it's also practically empowering us to uh, to do our part in environmental consciousness. We may not become environmental activists, but just as a part of our bhakti itself, we can do many things which can be helpful in taking care of the environment in small ways, small yet significant ways. So thank you very much Prabhu, for this wonderful discussion. I look forward to having you again for some future discussions. Thank you so much, Chaitanya and Prabhu. Always such a pleasure uh, spending time with you. I look forward to it very much.
and 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 to your wonderful insights. So always more comes from the conversation than just uh, what than than what would come individually through say a lecture or something like that. And this is why I appreciate the podcast format because dialogue always raises insights that um, monologues cannot. Right? That that are that are more than the sum of the parts. Uh, that are that are distinctly born from the meeting of two minds together. So um, I appreciate that very much. Thank you very much, Shruv. You can look forward to the future. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.